Thank you, and we're back. This is the Catholic Lady, and we are reading Great Line of God. We're in Chapter 4, and this will be beginning Part 2. Um, in Part 1, Saul had just encountered, he was going to visit his uh, little girlfriend that he had made, who was a slave in a, in a neighboring um, a villa, and uh, there was a wild, rabid jackal that uh, was there and tried to attack them at their little pond that they would meet at. And Saul has just finished killing the jackal and has gone to see if Dassel is okay. Okay. Chapter 4, Part 2. <coughs> Saul said, The beast is dead. The pool is poisoned. Poor Dassel. It is all over. You must not be afraid now. <clears throat> Dassel reached up dumbly for his hand, and he took it and tried to warm it between his own cold and pouring hands. She was trying to speak. He bent tenderly to hear her. Hercules, she said, and smiled dimly. dimly. Perseus, Odysseus. Saul drew her quaking body to its feet and attempted to laugh. It was nothing, he said. Could I abandon you? He put his soldier's arms about her body, holding it tightly against him in a sudden frenzy of joy and love. Do I not love you, my dear one? Water streamed from them, but their relief and their love warmed them, and the sun began to strike hotly on their bodies. Dassel lifted one of Saul's hands and humbly kissed it. Her wet black hair, as soft as silk, fell over his bared arms. At the touch of her lips, Saul trembled again, and desire struck him like a knife. Then the girl raised her head. She sought, he sought her lips, and not gently and pleasantly as during the months before, but with ardor and lust and passion. They were sweet against his and moist and cool. They parted in surrender and she wound her arms about his neck and pressed her body against his, murmuring he knew not what. He could feel her young breast against his chest, urgent and straining and taut. Instinctively, he reached for her breast and held one in the cup of his immediately hot and exploring hand, and she murmured again, languidly, clinging to him. He had never touched a woman's breast before, and the feel of it in his hand drove him almost out of his mind. Together, still clinging, they fell on the warm bank among the tall and dusty grass, and the world became one deep drum of passion and incoherent sound and heat and delicious struggle. Above them, the cataracts sang and the sun brightened and the golden dust floated in the air and there was a wild, sweet roaring in the youth's ears. Saul was totally lost. He obeyed the instincts of his flesh and was caught up in an inexplicable and overpowering sensation, agonizingly sweet yet terrible in its urgent intensity. He lay upon Dassel and took her savagely, and she held him to her and gently bit his throat and moaned with delight and pleasure. Their bodies were as a hot, hot as flame, and like flame they merged together, and all about them was the scent of agitated grasses and flowers, and the singing of the water. Entwined, they were conscious of nothing but ecstasy. Saul felt the moving of Dassel's flesh under him, and each movement intensified his sensations, and he could not know if they were pain or bliss. He felt her tongue licking his ear tenderly, and heard her moaning breath and felt her quickening movements. When the culmination arrived, he thought vaguely that he had died in one explosion of rapture and that it was a death not to be rude, for it was greater than life, like the bursting of a sun or a raining of stars. His eyes were closed. Sweating and gasping, he lay upon the girl, and it was some moments before he rolled from her body and lay beside her, overwhelmed with what had, he had experienced. He, he had no immediate thoughts. He had only memory of something of immense and incredible joy and a transport, beyond which was nothing comparable.
Vassal raised herself upon one elbow and looked down at him, smiling. Her lips bright, red, and swollen, her drying hair warm on her naked shoulders and breast. He felt her movement and sluggishness sluggishly opened his eyes, and he saw her face bent over him, and it was more beautiful than he had ever known. Slowly he lifted his hand and touched her cheek, and she turned that cheek and kissed the palm of his hand. He heard a deep chuckling in her white throat of contentment and affection. One bare, pale leg lay over one of his. Then, like a cold fist hitting his heart, he thought, I have ruined and deflowered and raped and ravaged this innocent child, and I am accursed. What is wrong, beloved? asked Dassel, alarmed at the pallor and the rigidity of the face below hers. He turned his head aside. He wanted to weep with despair and regret and shame that he had taken this pure one and had defiled her, and that she had submitted to his lust out of gratitude and because she was only a slave and so could not deny an urgent man. Truly, he was an anathema in the sight of God and men, and how could he atone for his sin and his crime? Who could forgive him? He deserved an ignominious death. Dassel began to stroke the strong red crest of his hair and his throat. You are a veritable hero, beloved, she said in her childish voice. I am yours forever. I am your slave, adorable one. Not even Venus had so puissant a protector and a lover, strong beyond the strength of other men. How could she envy me, the pearl of Cyprus? She kissed his cheek tenderly. Above her head, the sky had turned a flaming blue, and the golden cataract gushed in liquid music, and the pool was again the color of young lemons. The grass and moss were soft beneath them, and the languor held them. But Saul suffered in his soul profoundly. He said, Forgive me, my dear one, forgive me, if it is possible. Dassel's lustrous black eyes widened with astonishment above his. She bent to see him more clearly, as if incredulous that he had said these words. Metallic blue and his strange eyes were suffused with tears, and Dassel was amazed. Forgive you, she exclaimed. It is you who should forgive me for placing you in jeopardy with my carelessness. Forgive you? I adore you, my hero, my Apollo with hair like the sun and muscles like armor. If life holds nothing more for me than this morning, still I am grateful to all the gods that they permitted me to lie with you and comfort you and reward you. Saul tried to smile at this innocent childishness. He stroked the soft side of her throat with a gentle hand. But I ravaged you, dear one. I took advantage of your distraught state. I have deflowered you, and who can restore your purity? Dassel sat upright and abruptly. She stared down at him in wonderment. Then after a long, long moment, she began to smile. And it was a woman's humorous smile, and not a girl's. Is that what troubles you, my foolish one? She said with soothing affection. Go to. I am 17 years old, and am not a virgin. Surely you did not believe me, one. She laughed with tenderness. I have not been a virgin since I was 12 years old. I was bestowed on the overseer of my master's estate at that age, and we are to be married. I am pledged to him by my mistress, the noble Fabiola, and we will then be given our freedom and an olive grove, and we will be content. But I will love you always, even when I see you no more. Stunned and stricken and dumb, Saul listened to that light and happy voice, and finally he understood. He had been thinking as a Jew that this girl was a heathen and had been born and reared in an atmosphere alien to his knowledge, alien to his comprehension. To her, no sin had been committed. She had garnered pleasure as one chooses a bauble for an hour's gratification and then forgotten, discarded. 
She lived and had her being in a hedonist society where everything was permitted. Honor scorned, desecration a matter for laughter, adultery a moment's mere satisfaction, fornication accepted, and lasciviousness a thing to be cultivated and pursued. She belonged to a world detested and feared by Jews, execrated by them, avoided by them, and she was no longer Dassel, the innocent slave girl whom he had wept in secret, but the strange woman whose lips were the portals to hell. In the pit of her body he, Saul ben Hillel, had incontinently and precipitously fallen, and he was lost. He was dirtied and corrupted beyond redemption. He was forsaken beyond hope, except that he devote his whole life to penance and remorse and repentance. God had averted his face from him, and how could he atone in one short lifetime? He had laid with a harlot. What is it? asked Dazzle in consternation. She had sought to comfort and ease him. She had given herself to him in delight and love and gratitude, and he had given her the gift of enormous pleasure, as she had also given it to him. Yet he lay on the grass below her with a face of bitter iron and despair. Saul sat up, and she watched him, and with disbelief at his silence and his awful withdrawal, she watched him shake out his wet and wrinkled tunic, why did he not speak or smile? Why did he avoid her eyes? How had she offended him? Of what grossness was she guilty? Alarmed and beseeching, she touched his knee with her hand, but he started away from her as from the touch of vileness and horror. He sprang to his feet. He looked about him wildly. Tears fell, upon his, fell from his eyes. Then, without speaking, he fled from her and was soon lost among the trees, and the puzzled and frightened girl was alone, aimlessly and distractedly pondering in her mind his peculiar behavior of one she loved and had in some way mortally offended. She saw the basket of pomegranates which he had brought her, and she began to eat one, and the red juice trickled down her chin. Then she laughed softly and shrugged and shook her head. Men were not to be understood by women. One day he would return to her. She looked down at her beautiful and naked body and was pleased. Saul never returned to that lovely spot and never thought of it again without aversion and loathing and shame. It haunted his life. Worse still, he acquired a disgust for women which remained with him. All female flesh thereafter was tainted by the scent of dassel in warm autumn grass, and the arms of women were the arms of pale serpents, unless they were virgins or horrible wives. Even then, they were suspect and always to be feared. Hillel ben Borush visited Aristo at the freedman's small but comfortable quarters. What ails my son, Aristo? the anxious father asked. He is silent and pallid and brooding. He loves you. He has not confided has he not confided in you that we may help him? Aristo knew his pupil far better than did the parent, youth's parents or Red Isaac. He suspected that in some unknown spot, at some some unknown hour, the rigid young Pharisee had encountered a woman and it had shocked him to the heart. Were it not so amusing, Aristo would have felt concern. He knew that Saul no longer crept away in silence too early in the morning for his school, so it was a woman. Aristo sighed. These Jews, they regarded human pleasure with suspicion and avoided it. What a grim deity it was theirs. Aristo thanked the gods in whom he did not believe that such a deity had kept his aff afflictions of mind and soul to himself and his special and circumscribed votaries. 
What is it that you suspect, Aristo? asked the troubled father, who had a very keen eye. I voice no suspicions, Lord, said Aristo with respect, for I have none. But perhaps our Saul is coming into manhood and is disturbed by his longings and unnamed desires. Hillel blushed, and Aristo was freshly amused. Saul is not ready for marriage, said Hillel. Aristo could not help saying, Get him, then, some compliant slave girl. Hillel regarded him sternly. We are forbidden to abuse women, even slaves or servants. Aristo chortled, but with respect. That is not in accord with your teachings, of which Saul has informed me. Did not your David, the king, lust for Bathsheba, and order the murder of her husband so that he could possess her? And I have read the Song of Songs, and surely Solomon was not addressing those songs to his wives, who were possibly very decorous and uninteresting matrons. He smiled at Hillel. I have always thought your hero Joseph a fool, or an Enoch, for refusing Potiphar's wife. Dear Master, your Jews are very rigid and do not enjoy life. Surely your God is not a Pharisee. Hillel could not help smiling. Rab Isaac thinks so, though I do not. Aristo said, Remember your own youth, Lord, for you are a handsome man and doubtless inspired glances for maidens. It is your own counsel. Let Saul keep his. Hillel sighed. Life is a disease from which we do not recover, but by which we are mortally infected. I will keep my counsel as you advise, Aristo. I will not question Saul. Questions are invariably insulting from fathers. He paused. It is very strange that those we beget and love are alien to us and are understood only by others. Is that God's reminder that we do not possess our children and that we give them their flesh only and that we must never claim them but must always let them go? Your souls belong to God and not to us. It is sad to be a father. One day Aristo said, his silent, said to his silent and stony pupil, I do, know no, I do not know what it is that torments you, Saul, but nothing is disastrous eternally. In this world, nothing is fixed in time. We must learn at last to forgive others. Saul said with sudden and startling fierceness, There are things of which a man can never forgive himself. Aristo smiled faintly. Assuredly, the betrayal of trusting friends. Dishonor where dishonor was not deserved. Malice, returning love with hatred. Crimes against the innocent and the helpless. Stupidity, lack of tolerance. The rejection of permitted pleasure. Gloom where there is sunshine. Abstinence where wine is offered. Arrogance without a reason to be arrogant. Hypocrisy, sniveling guile, cruelty without provocation, lies, desert, desertions, malvolence, deceit, fasting when fa feasting is at hand, denial of life and joy, covering of the face when dancing is encountered, a harsh voice amid music, the presentation of evil when given good. Of which of these, Saul of Tarshish, are you guilty? Of none, said Saul, whose bright color had faded recently. Then of nothing dire, you, dire are you guilty, said Aristo. But he thought, of some of these you are guilty, my poor pupil, but do, you do not know your guilt, and possibly you will never be forgiven. May your gloomy deity eventually forgive you, though I doubt other gods will. Then he laughed to himself. It is very probable that you do not understand your God at all and only malign him. And that's the end of chapter four.